actually this month. Um, Angular 2.1 had a uh, change where if you're using the router, now it can lazy load routes. Um, so if you have like a big chunk of your code that you don't necessarily need to access right at startup, you can push that off um, and it'll load it when the user actually visits that route, which is handy. And it uh, can increase the speed that your with your app loads. So that's a big thing if you're using Angular. Um, the other one too was Node uh, 7 came out in stable. That was a big one. They did a couple of big updates to um, how it like their um, V8 engine on the back end. So they're now 98% compliant with ES 2015, which is pretty big. So you can use all the classes, uh, <coughs> things like that. And they also, there's another change. Oh, they right now if you're using Node and you're using promises, if an exception happens, it basically just disappears. And the convention with Node when exceptions are raised is to crash the process and you get a nice stack trace and things like that. So a lot of people in Node really don't like the fact that promises swallow exceptions. So with this version, that's starting to change. So that behavior has been deprecated. You'll now get a warning if uh, an exception <coughs> is raised in a promise and not caught. And the idea is that in the future, that'll actually change. So that just like if an exception is raised in synchronous code, if something crashes and you're using promises, it'll crash the process just like how it does now. So it should be, it's kind of weird, but if you've used Node at all, it's, it's a pretty nice change. It makes your whole exception handling workflow a lot more smoother and things like that, uh, just consistent. Uh, other things too, NPM upgraded to version four. The big focus, it seemed like on this one, was improving search. I don't know if people have used search with the NPM client in the past, but it's pretty bad now. It's just gotten so big. Um, you know, the size of the index and stuff like that, that it would take forever. Essentially, you would just always search on the website and using the command line was useless. So they've improved that a lot. There are some changes to how search works, but I think for most users, they shouldn't impact people to use it. Uh, and it is usable now, so that's a pretty big thing. Uh, Ember JS had a 2.0 release. I'm honestly not totally familiar with what is in that. Maybe. It's a 3.0 release. Oh, sorry, 3.0 release. Oh, sorry. All right, um, well, do you know what's in it then? Or? Uh, no, I haven't. Okay. Um, the other one too, this was an entry one, I just put it here because it was kind of an example of what can happen when you're a larger project. Visual Studio Code had a 1.7 release, uh, I think yesterday or the day before, that really almost crashed the MPN registry because um, it was going and it would automatically download information about your packages, something called typings, which describe the different types in a JavaScript library. It was doing that automatically, and NPM saw such a huge spike in traffic that Microsoft actually reverted their release and went back to the 1.61, one, um, and then released a new version just today that basically disabled that feature. So, yeah. Um, I just wanted to clarify the Angular does not change the router. Is oh. something you can uh, lazy load, so you can preload your lazy load your browser. Oh, you can preload them. OK, all right. So what is the difference there? Like, when you say preload, what does that mean? Um, so you get your like, main route, and then you have like, you know, a set of like, lazy, lazy routes, you mm -hmm. load them on your Right. So that they would, so it's like an incremental load. Okay, so now you can say like it kind of does the first load and then it can preload the lazy loaded routes in the background yeah. or anything? Yeah. Oh, I see. That's cool. All right. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thanks. Okay, um, the other thing too is that we were getting some feedback at the last hack up that people were enjoying them, um, but that maybe switching to uh, having them every week might be useful for people. Uh, just to kind of get some more momentum in terms of the projects they were working on. So I just want to do a quick poll of everyone here. If we switched from a monthly hackup format to a weekly one, how many people would be interested in going through a weekly hackup? <laughs> a couple of hands. Okay. I think I'd be interested, but I think uh, like I don't really understand what, what goes on there. Mm -hmm. Like I was interested in the last one, mm -hmm. but um, like the description, I don't know, maybe the description's off. But I, like I was understanding this be like installing the yard. Mm -hmm. Wasn't sure like that. So I'm interested in something like a more involved Okay, like a kind of a challenge or something like that? A challenge or like anything, like maybe someone has something to share, like maybe like, oh, here's how you do, I don't know, like, uh, well, I'm not really on the spot, but, uh, you know, like maybe like, you know, here's how the simple React app, or like here's how to do, or we can have like, you know, maybe a, um, like a search box or something. Right. Or, or, or I don't know, you know, something hopefully more imaginative. Okay. And maybe, uh, you know, from a little here, It'd be kind of cool if we worked in with the, the um, some of the stuff the topics we covered here. So like we covered React here, so maybe we would be hacked up with all the React stuff. That's a great idea. Lab, lab section. Yeah, well, that's exactly what this could be. Like, I think that's something that we would definitely like to do. The big thing right now is just kind of a constraint on resources. 
So uh, if there is interest in terms of that, definitely maybe just send me a tweet or just approach me after the meeting today. Let me know that you're interested in doing a hack up like that and we can try to find some resources to make that happen. Because um, it would be great to do something like that. I feel like maybe there's probably a fragment of questions. I feel like when I hear the question, we do want to come to a weekly hack up and maybe sound like come every week. Yeah. Okay. Um, but maybe like a better way to, to, if there was like a week, let's say it was at the same time every week, mm. uh, start on Wednesdays at from 6 to 6 to 8 or something. Right. It was a kind of a drop in time and maybe there's an RSVP. Mm. Would people be interested in using that drop in opportunity on like, uh, I don't know, would they come from time to time? Yeah, yeah, I think that's important to say. We wouldn't expect people to come up. Yeah. Kind of, I know. We're gonna need another survey. Let's see. Okay. Well, um, maybe let's put up something on Twitter too. That might work better. So the question would be like, why? Well, well, the biggest thing that I heard at the last hack up is that people enjoyed it, but they only do it once a month. It's just you know, it's two, three hours once a month. It doesn't give you a lot of time to get into a project or a challenge like that. So is the idea basically like we we like be like like Sean's idea of having like. Wednesdays from six to eight, come up and just work on whatever you're working on. The other people working on whatever they're working on, and you can ask questions off each other and whatnot. It could be. I mean, I think that's what we've been doing so far. Um, maybe what I'll say is just because we don't have to have the whole discussion right now. Why don't, uh, if you're interested, come for drinks afterwards, and we can talk about this at drinks. But it would be good to see something happen there, because um, it is. It's nice to have a, a place where we can actually write code and stuff like that too. And build stuff. It's kind of fun. okay. Um, so we'll carry that discussion on uh, after the beer. Um, other things came out of this. We have a Gitter channel now. I mentioned this at the last meetup. It's basically uh, like IRC almost, but it's on the web. Uh, it's nice because it's tied in to GitHub. So if you have a GitHub account, you can sign in already. Uh, and it's tied in right to our, our GitHub repo and everything like that. So if you, uh, you know how in comments on GitHub, you can put a little star and an issue number. It does the same kind of thing with this, and it pops up the issue there. It does some nice things with code pens and stuff too. So I don't know. It's kind of like a programmer chat, so it's, it's handy. We've been using it at the hackups as a kind of back channel to share links and stuff like that. Uh, the other thing too is we are still actively looking for sponsors. I think we're about 90% of the way there on our budget. We're just tying up a couple more things. But um, when uh, that happens, we still have a little more room and we would love to be able to get in a speaker or something like that from what a town. So if you're interested in supporting the meetup, you can talk to me, you can go to exchangejs.com. Uh, you can send us a tweet, basically have everyone to get in touch. We would love to hear from you. And um, I'd also just like to say a big thank you again to Jobber. Um, I have it later on the slides here, but you guys have been a great supporter so far. And uh, we have some other things in the works that I'll uh, hopefully we'll talk about next week. So. Um, yeah, so All right, I will go through all these. There are some other extra links that I just wanted to point out, um, but I will link to these from the actual meetup uh, event if you want to read them. Okay, other news, any other big releases or anything like that that I've missed here? All right. Okay, so moving on to events. Um, there's the typical events happening at startup here throughout the month. Um, so I'll point out just the Python user group. I'll point out we have our next hack up on the 16th. Uh, and also Demo Camp 33 is happening on the 22nd. Our next meetup is on December 1st. Uh, I also wanted to point out, I don't know, uh, how many people have women or daughters or people like that in their lives moving interested in coding, but the uh, library, I think, is working with the university and hosting an event called Code, uh, just about the gender gender gap in technologies and things like that. That so, is an amazing film. Everyone should go watch it. Is it? Yeah. Okay, so it's happening on the 15th um, at the Garneau Theater. So the other cool thing, too, is that the money from tickets is going to support the renovations of the library. So you're also supporting the library and things like that. So I just thought I'd mention that. Uh, I will probably be there, and hopefully we'll see you guys. Uh, hack up Wednesday, November fifteenth, and what's that? Does it, oh, maybe I wrote the wrong date. No, sorry, it's the sixteenth. This is the wrong date in my notes. It's it's the sixteenth. Yeah, I'm sure it's the sixteenth. Let's just do this. Yeah, Is it? Yeah. Wednesday is perfect. Yeah, it's on the Wednesday. There we go. Okay. Um, any other events, any conferences or anything like that coming up? I know there's a couple of React ones and things, but. MNGConf is starting their ticket lottery security. They are? Okay. And when is actually MNGConf happening? I think, I think in the spring. In the spring, okay. But they do a ticket lottery security. You're going to start your name and it's free. Oh, cool. If you get drawn, you, can, you have the option to buy a ticket. 
Oh, I see. Okay, cool. Are any other events coming up that people want to mention? Okay. Um, so other things happening. Uh, there are a lot of jobs again this month. So Jobber is hiring. So maybe we'll start with you guys. Uh, ben, if you want to say a quick word? Yeah. Uh, so Jobber, local company, uh, really focused on supporting small businesses, so doing software, and just like in general resources to help small business. And in particular, small business that are home service or field service, so where the workers are doing work in the field or on customer sites. Um, we are well, on the border of being able to justify ourselves as a startup. We still view ourselves as a startup for about 70 people now. Um, product development team of uh, uh, we just crossed 30 people just on product development and a lot of really great people, a lot of really smart people, um, and uh, constantly like, pushing ourselves to, to do what we do better. And uh, just looking for still pretty much all the roles across the map. So uh, developers, junior to senior, uh, designers, uh, front end developers, and then on, on the other roles as well. So customer success, sales, all those types of roles as well. So if you know anyone who's more on that side of things, uh, they should check out our website. We've got job postings there. Um, and in terms of technologies, uh, the two main technologies are, are Ruby. So we use Rails to kind of core the application. And uh, then we're starting to add more JavaScript into, into our app over time. We're actually just in the process of building our first uh, kind of uh, node-based microservice right now as well. So if you're interested to talk to me or anyone from Java, put your hands. So if you're interested oh, to talk to me those people. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Um, we also have Gratify is looking to hire um, front-end developers here. I'm hoping to get someone from Gratify out to the next meetup. Is anyone here from Gratify tonight? No, sorry. They're supposed to come in and we're able to make it. Um, so Gratify, just so you guys know, uh, it's a local company. And what they do is if you have an e-commerce site, they work with you to kind of understand the people that are potentially making purpose purchases on your site. And then through the understanding they have of their shopping patterns and things like that, they can basically generate custom offers that are intended to get that person to go and complete a purchase. So you know they'll go and say, okay, this person will make more purchases if there's free shipping, things like that. Um, and so the idea that they take things where you have a cart that might not get completed, and through these offers and incentives and things like that, will, on a person-by-person -person basis, complete those sales. So they're doing some pretty interesting stuff. There's a lot of machine learning and things going on there. And they also use a lot of JavaScript on the front end. So. Uh, Shobi, they do educational software. Um, a lot of it is around iPads and things like that. Uh, they are looking for front-end developers. Clio, I know we have someone from Clio. So. Yeah, uh, Clio is just starting a basic complete rewrite of the Rails application to be back on our API, which is already used for the mobile and the iOS apps. So we're basically starting in either, right now on 5, but it will be soon be in the new application, totally back on the API. Um, so it's kind of an exciting time to be there. Um, yeah, um, and we're hiring Rails developers, JavaScript developers, um, I think iOS and Android. We'll and that's here in Edmonton, right? Yeah, so it, it's, it's remote from Edmonton, the head office is in Vancouver. So you get to go there a few times a year, which is kind of fun too. Okay. And just quickly, like, kind of elevator pitch, what does Clio do? Um, they software for lawyers. So if a lawyer is doing something, you want to be helping them with it. So time tracking, um, matter tracking, document tracking, um, everything around there. Um, we also and are starting to do some interesting stats around lawyers too to kind of help them on their firms more efficiently. Hmm. So, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, Overhaul is a uh, local kind of media design company. They are looking for front end developers. Do we have anyone from Overhaul here tonight? No? All right. Maybe can you just tell us a bit about you guys and what you're looking for? Um, I, don't, I don't know what we're looking for. I can speak for that, but we need print and local design. Okay, great. So probably front end JavaScript stuff. We, we can most. Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, this is a link I know to the job listing too. So. Um, other things going on, MicroQuest, uh, they work in uh, kind of the medical services side of things for document management, practice management, things like that. Um, they're looking for developers here in Edmonton, mostly doing front end stuff. Is anyone here from MicroQuest? Perfect. All right, um, so again, this is a link to their job board, so if you want to check it out. Um, and the last one is, Mu I, I want to say this wrong, Musica? I think it's mu like. Mizuka, it's like Mizuka, yeah. Um, anyway, they're down in Calgary, but they're doing some interesting stuff just with um, social and kind of music integration and things like that. So they are also, again, looking for people to do some cool um, front end stuff because they're on Facebook and Twitter and things like that. So they have a lot of, it's kind of a web facing business right now. 
Um, all right. So why don't we take a quick break here? We have a couple speakers lined up. Uh, I noticed there's lots of food still there, so if you haven't had a chance, go grab a pita. And our first speaker tonight is going to be uh, Casey Yindenberg talking about what is a promise. So this is the second talk in our new JavaScript Basics series. Um, we try to make JavaScript a bit more approachable to everybody. So. All right, thanks, Casey. <laughs> How do I get out of full screen? How do I get out of full screen? Uh, the main. I don't know if there's a keyword trick anywhere. You go to view, and you can exit full screen. Oh, okay. So it looks like it's stuck screen sharing. I'll tell you one second. No, this one. That. So I meant it once. Oh, from that. Yeah. Oh, you know what I realized? Though? It doesn't do um, both axes, right? It just goes left and right. So if there's kind of height to your size, it goes up. It looks like someone can, I can just get it here. It's like I lost it. You know? got close. Is it minimized down here? I, I might oh, have yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah sorry. <laughs> um, oh, it's like speeches I never use. It looks uh, like it's me. Yeah. 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 So, so if you go full screen again, the share is yeah, okay. So this one oh. You can just press the little green jewel, whatever they call those. Yeah. And then we go. Now it's a little right? Yeah. 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 You know, this this is fine. This is probably fine. If you go to view, there's not Oh, that's why. So now, you know, if you go down there, there's a line. Yeah, there it is. Okay. Not going to touch it. We're screen sharing. Okay, so my name is Casey, and um, this is based on a blog post that I wrote a few months ago that I thought would be a good follow-up to Mark's talk last month on uh, closures and callbacks. So what is a promise? Um, well, you probably can't see this, but this is the Netflix show Stranger Things. It's a few days after Halloween, so I thought it would be a good place to start. And in this show, this mysterious girl, Eleven, who has grown up in a lab, and so she lacks some basic knowledge that you would expect most people to have, actually asks this exact question, what is a promise? And her new friend Mike says, it's something you can't break ever. And this is an okay definition if you're a 13-year-old kid, um, but we're jaded adults, and to us, promise sounds something more like um, Justin Trudeau. We are committed to ensuring that 2015 will be the last federal election conducted under the first past the post voting system. At this point, maybe it'll happen, maybe it, maybe it won't, we don't know. And that's what we have to guard against as citizens and as programmers is things going right and also things going wrong. Um, so if we bring this back to JavaScript, my favorite definition of what a promise is um, comes from Alex uh, Welkmeyer, who writes a blog called Tuality, that you should really check out. And he defines a promise as a container for an asynchronously delivered value. And I like this definition because it kind of lets you think of promises like a box. Even if you don't know the contents of that box, you can still assign it, pass it around, take it on an airplane, give it to your kid. Um, and maybe that's not a good idea if you don't know the contents of the box, but it's physically possible. <coughs> Um, so why is any of this necessary? Well, when I first started programming for the web, 
I was using a lot of external APIs, and in languages like PHP, but also Ruby, Python, C, Java, you can write things that look like this. Um, data equals file get contents and pass a URL, and it'll come back with the data that you're after. And I love this because it's beautiful, it's simple, it looks exactly like any other statement in your program. You're evaluating an expression and passing and assigning it to a variable. Um, but what I didn't think about much at the time was how much is going on behind the scenes here. This isn't x equals x plus 1. This is spinning up an HTTP request. A whole bunch of things, stuff is going on in the background just on your own computer. And in addition to that, it's sending a request off across the network. And it can't continue executing your code until it comes back, because you could be using this data variable in the very next line. So what happens in PHP and those other languages is, is that execution simply pauses here. In JavaScript, that isn't acceptable, because your application, your Node.js application, or whatever code you've written to run in the browser is running on a single thread. And the browser is sharing that thread with lots of other stuff. And so while it's waiting, your user interface would be unresponsive. Your, ser your server would <coughs> not be able to respond to other requests. So what happens in JavaScript is that if you use this kind of function here, HTTP.get, you still pass this URL, but code execution simply continues past this function. And so to deal with this, what you pass in is a second variable, which is a callback function that basically says to JavaScript, when you get this response back, execute this function, and it'll tell you what to do with it. <coughs> so there's a second pattern here where you could use a promise to do the same kind of thing. And although this code looks almost identical at this point, this promise is an actual object. This expression is evaluating to something. It comes with methods attached to it that describe what to do with when the response comes back. And although this looks at this point very similar to the callback pattern, there's several advantages to doing it this way. First off is readability. So we talked a couple of times last month about how when you get a lot of these callbacks together, they just keep messing. And eventually the code um, becomes what's often referred to as callback hell, or simply unreadable. Second, they provide, I think, a superior way of dealing with errors. Because if you think callback hell is bad on its own, um, imagine what happens when you also need to put in all, all of the callbacks that are necessary to deal with the errors you could get back. And thirdly, um, this then function, as I'm going to show you a bit later, also returns another promise. And this provides a way that you can chain a lot of promises <laughs> together and also return them from functions. Uh, so promises have actually been around the JavaScript ecosystem for Quite a while, jQuery has the concept of referred, uh, sorry, deferred, which um, you can use to make uh, AJAX requests. Um, there's also a, a few different libraries that implement them, but tonight I'm going to talk specifically about the ES6 specification for promises because this is now part of the core of the language itself. And uh, I don't know if you can see this, but it's implemented. Pretty much everywhere, uh, you can probably guess which browser doesn't implement it. And also uh, in nodes at 0 0.12. And if you do need to support other browsers, older browsers, there are polyfills. And finally, if you transpile your code using Babel or something, it will actually inject one of these polyfills for you so you can uh, use promises just like the native implementation. Uh, so how does this work? Well. One way to demonstrate it is that you can pretty much wrap any <clears throat> function which executes asynchronous callbacks uh, within a promise. So when you create a new promise, uh, you specify a single argument, which is a function, and you inject into that function uh, the methods resolve and later reject. And you can call resolve whenever you've received the data that you think you need to proceed. So in this case, um, within our promise, we're calling the set timeout function um, and then resolving here with just this asinine text. And we can later use that promise in another function um, to execute a dot then callback 
and um, this will execute when the promise is resolved and prints out our message to the console. But this is a pretty boring and stupid example because first of all, there's really no way for set timeout to fail, and um, secondly, you know, why would we care about the data that we're passing through here? Um, so if we were to take the HTTP.get method that I was talking about earlier and wrap that in a promise, what we could do would be to say, okay, if when we get this response back, if the response code uh, from the request is 200, meaning that everything is okay, we resolve with the body of the, of the response. And if it's um, anything else, we reject. So how would you use this? Just like before, uh, you can pass in um, <clears throat> any URL you like. Uh, if you care, this would get the weather in Whistler, British Columbia, and then uh, print that out to the console. If there's an error, then, uh, well, in this case, we do the same thing, but you could have a separate function defined for dealing with that error. Or you can use the dot .catch method at the end of the chain. And these two things are almost identical, but not quite. And the only difference is that any um, error which executes within our catch function will also be caught, or sorry, any error which executes within our then function will also be caught by a later catch. But if they're passed in here as parallel parameters to then, um, then it will only catch errors that occur. So like I was saying before, the real power of this comes when you're performing multiple asynchronous operations. So in that previous example, we were getting this data, but we weren't even parsing the JSON that was coming back. Um, we might want to do that parsing asynchronously if it's going to take a long time. And so in this case, we're executing two different functions, one where we're getting data from, say, a database, and another where we're processing data. And uh, within that second function in the callback pattern, we'd be dealing, dealing with that data. If we were to encapsulate this logic in a function, there's nothing we can return because our return statement would have to be within the callback and um, it wouldn't be accessible to the other scope. Unless we wrap both of these callback functions in a promise, and thanks to the miracle of closure, we can call resolve once um, both of these processes have been completed. And so when we were called resolve with the process data, we could then pass that uh, data to our uh, .then handler. So even though this code is uglier than um, even the code on the previous slide, maybe it's enough to just encapsulate it and uh, not have to worry too much about later history of the black box. What you'll probably more commonly see for dealing with multiple asynchronous operations is the concept of chaining promises. Chaining promises. So what's very useful is that these dot then methods always return another promise. Um, and that's true whether you return with a promise or with a primitive. And this is really useful because it allows you to be a little bit lazy about um, what you're doing uh, within your .NET callbacks and um, be confident that you're always getting back a promise at the end of it. So this has several advantages. You can break the chain anywhere in return, separate the logic based on what makes sense to you and not what you're being forced to do. Um, a dot .catch at the end of the chain will handle an error anywhere in the chain. And um, you can return this promise Sorry, you can return another promise to deal with the result of that promise. So the, five, the next callback in the chain won't be executed until any asynchronous processes that you're depending on um, have resolved. A final little trick um, that you should know about is uh, executing parallel promises, and this is done with the promise.all method. So this method accepts an array of promises and it only resolves, it creates a new, and then creates a new promise which only resolves once all of the promises in the array have resolved. Um, so that can be useful in certain cases, I'm sure you can think of. 
Okay. Um, I haven't included error, very many errors in the code that I've seen that I've been showing just for the sake of um, simplicity. But as Mark was saying in the introduction, up until recently in a lot of environments, um, an error thrown within a promise would actually fail <coughs> silently. So uh, you can guard against this by not forgetting to catch and at the very least um, logging that error to the console so that when you're developing, you'll be aware of it. Um, you can also use Bluebird, Blue, the Bluebird library, which is exactly like um, the native promise library, but will print the error to the console by default. And like Mark was saying, Node is now moving to um, dealing with the error by crashing the app instead of just failing silently, which is probably a superior way of doing it. Okay, so um, I spent 11 years in academia, and I still like to end my talks with acknowledgments. So these are, uh, well, the, the URLs are in the slides. You can go and see them, but these are um, posts that I um, drew heavily from when I was working on my post on this talk. That's it. Great. Thank you. We've got time for a couple questions. Are there any questions for Casey? What promises are you given? So if I have three promises, each returning the value one, what do I get in the then? In using promise.all? Yeah. Uh, Casey, could I just ask you to repeat the question just so that Okay, so if the question I think was um, if you have three promises in this array, what what's values basically? It's going to be so it's also an array, an array. of yeah. three more promises. Of three values, three values, because it's not returning until each of those promises is resolved. Is there a situation where you would prefer using the callback pattern as opposed to promises? Well, there's certain cases where you have to use it, so a promise can only resolve once. So an event handler like an express route or button dot on click or something like that, like handler for a button, you wouldn't want to use a promise in that pattern because once it resolves, the promise is gone. Um, so you could use it later. You'll be able to use generator functions and things like that. But in this right now, probably event handlers are the best way. To Another follow-up question: um, Do you think all libraries should support more promise pattern and the callback pattern? You're starting to see some. I think like all the like Mongoose still supports the callback pattern. Um, I guess for stuff like Mongoose and for Fetch, which is a URL <coughs> library, like I don't know that there's really a need to support callbacks anymore because those are in that situation where they can only resolve once except to support legacy code, but you know that's what major versions before and stuff like that. So and the tool kind of gives you the promise that this can RSPS with the line. Right. Alright, very simplistically, um, the RSGS allows the promise to return more than once. Um, there's other um, things too that are going on with promises right now too that are just at the specification stage right now. But one of the things that promises don't capture is any sense of cancellation. Because um, you have guys like, like if you're doing an XHR fetch, fetch excuse me, they, um, there's a fetch API that they've run that has promises in it. And one of the things people realized really quickly that was missing from it um, was if you're using the promise based API and you start a big HTTP request, you can't cancel it. Um, whereas with XHR you could. And so there's work to, to add that in, but it's not really clean right now, so it hasn't been forward for a while. So, um, so, okay. so <laughs> the question is, when you invest time on promise or on guarantee with RSGS? I don't know. I, I actually been, so there's an observable spec that's also in the works based off of things like RSGS. Um, but it's hitting some friction right now in terms of things like how errors are handled. Um, and also how it might potentially integrate with cancelable promises. So what I would say is I would definitely look at something like RTS. It seems like it's coming and it's going to be part of some spec in the future. But I would be prepared for whatever that spec is to be a little bit different than how RSGS and things like that work right now. So you probably still have a bit of churn in your code in the future. <laughs>
Why would you print for how do you like to the notes? All right, um, so without further ado, up next we have Greg Bell, who's going to talk, us, talk to us about when to use React. This is the first in the series of four talks, I think it is. I think that's what it was. Uh, five, I guess. Mm -hmm. This is the fifth one. I guess, that's true. All right, so Greg is going to talk about when to use React, and I'll grab your slides here. There you go. Thank you, Greg. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess we've had a whole bunch of uh, interest in React, um, and there's a whole bunch of hype on the internet about React, and there, it's getting a lot of a lot of interest. So, uh, with all of that hype comes the danger that you all get this impression that it's the best thing ever, and it's going to solve all your problems for everything you have have to do. Um, and I'm going to tell you that that's not true, and hopefully give you some info on whether it's useful for your project or not. Um, and like Mark said, there's going to be more talks on React over the next couple months. So uh, Christian's going to do uh, an intro one. I'm going to on on like actually developing a React app from scratch. I'm going to do one on Flux and Redux, which is this backing engine for for data in React. And then I forget what the other ones are. Oh, React Native is another one. Right, maybe Christian's React. Do React Native. Um, okay, so to get everyone on the same page, I'm going to do a couple minutes on what actually is React. And basically, at its core, React is a function, is a machine for turning state into HTML. And what I mean by state is everything that is in your app to the, that changes over time as you do things, as the user interacts, as, as things come in from the internet. Um, so, in this example, it's just a list of users, and the HTML on the right is, uh, I guess it's the same for everyone, uh, is, is just going to be like a table, but it's, it's stored as an array, and you can have like checkboxes, the, which checkboxes are checked off, that state, which, what drop-down list is selected, that state, what's in a text box. Um, for the purposes of React, that's essentially got to be a JavaScript object. So if you're doing something like jQuery, maybe there's you're storing a bunch of state in in HTML in properties in HTML, and if you're using an MVC framework, it's in your model. Uh, for React, generically, it's in a it's in a JavaScript object, but it gets more complicated than that, um, which will be in January. We'll talk about Redux. Um, so React is a view layer. Uh, it is totally concerned with just producing HTML from values. Uh, it covers the same same stuff as jQuery and like a handlebars template or, or a mustache template. Uh, the the V and the MVC is a tagline they used to use for React. Um, so it is just concerned with with displaying HTML and their there are other technologies around React that all that'll complete the the cycle of like how do you how do users interact with it how do you, uh, how do you store data um, so what what is the difference between all of these things if these things already exist <clears throat> hopefully there is some kind of different uh, way of React doing it that will that will improve your life somehow so. One of the major changes is declarative components. So with, with all of these other systems, you had to learn a new templating language. Um, it may have been limited in what you could do, like for handlebars, like, I don't know if this is still true, but there was no else statements. Like you had to do if positive and then like if negative. And I don't, I don't know if that's still true because I haven't used handlebars in a long time, but, um, or like, you know, ng repeat only does I'm dissing it. I'm, I'm not going to diss Angular because I haven't used it in a long time, too. But for React, it is JavaScript. JavaScript is your templating language. So anything you want to do in React, anything you can do in React, uh, it's just going to be JavaScript. Um, plus, 
it's going to look like HTML. So this is JSX. It is the, the I don't remember what it stands for anymore. It's mm -hmm. JavaScript extension something. Um, but it's just going to be a combination of HTML looking stuff and uh, JavaScript. And it's going to compile down to raw, straight JavaScript. Um, so what, what gets loaded into the browser is just JavaScript. Um, and the other thing is how it renders stuff. So uh, with something like jQuery, you were handling a lot of these state transitions yourself with the, oh no, OK. Um, with, uh, with React, what you're going to do is you're going to create this template. Uh, you're going to feed it some data. React's going to render it. And then React is going to compare that against what is currently in the browser, do a diff, and then only apply the changes that it needs to, to, uh, to change. So if we add another value to this list, all that's going to change is that little value. And then it's going on. OK. No, that's good. OK. Um, yeah, if you add another line to this, it's only going to add that line. If you add like 10,000 lines, then it's going to add that. If you change a color, it's only going to change that, that CSS class that defines that color. Um, so that's what React is. Um, so it's great. I love it. I'm using it on the front end for our for Edmover. Um, it's it's really much better than anything I've used before as far as my personal preference. But maybe it's not useful in your use case. So we'll go through some use cases. Um, React is really concerned about handling like complex state in the in the handling complex state, but also like complex state transitions. So if you have one user action and that changes lots of things on your on your page, like user clicks a button and you have to do an async load of like a thousand things plus change colors on these things and all this kind of stuff, then that can get complicated. Um, and React's goal is to make that kind of complicated transition a lot easier. And the same thing for like multiple actions happening on your on your website. It's, it helps sequence that that out and hopefully you're not like getting into weird states like half through halfway through a transition. Um, that flux, which is another part of what React, what Facebook has developed, um, helps with that. And so, same thing with Redux. Um, so uh, yeah, React is about doing browser rendering. So if you're doing backend rendering, so like static HTML or like PHP or Rails or Forms, that should be a separate thing. Um, if it's just like I'm going to render render HTML in the backend and I'm going to load, I'm going to serve HTML, you're probably not going to get a lot out of React. Like if all you're doing with your JavaScript is like validation and and like submitting forms and stuff, you're not going to get a lot of use out of React. Um, the, the other thing is if you, depending on how your app is being developed, React might have a much more complicated tool chain than what you're using right now. So uh, with the JSX that I showed earlier, that has to get transformed into just regular JavaScript. Um, there is an assumption that, that you are using ES6 um, features, so like arrow functions and lets and things like that, that for the most part needs to get transformed into basic ES5 that it will work everywhere. Um, all of the components that you create with React are going to be in separate files. So if you're not, if you're just serving like one monolithic JS file, that's not going to work. You need to have something like Browserify or Webpack that's going to combine all of these things from one, from multiple files into one file um, and serve that. Um, you need, pretty much need source maps uh, because the, the JS that you're seeing on the browser is much different from the CS or the JS that you're actually writing. So source maps helps a lot with that. Um, there's a couple of browser plugins that help with React. Um, I don't use it a ton, uh, but there is a there's a React browser plugin from from Facebook that will help you understand like what the HTML you're seeing is 
versus what the JSX was that you wrote. Um, and then you're gonna need something that combines all of this stuff. So uh, grunt or gulp or like make files if you wanna, you know, hate yourself. Um, you will, you'll need something that, that combines all of this tool chain uh, <coughs> together. So depending on what you're doing, if you're just doing like serving PHP and JavaScript files and like pushing them up to an FTP site, this is gonna be a big change. Um, uh, Kristen's gonna do uh, a talk on, on using a, a standard template to, to get all this stuff uh, with a new, with a new project, but if you're trying to integrate it with an old project, you know you could have you could have problems. Um, but on the plus side, it does allow for some some really cool features. Um, hot reloading. So if you save something on your on your dev site, it can automatically be loaded into into your browser, and it if you do it right, can preserve the state of what you are working on, but with the new code. Um, and then time travel debugging, so you can set it up so that actions that you perform on, on the website can be rewound, and you can like save these, these action chains and like replay them on your browser, so this is really useful for debugging or like getting debugging reports from, from users where it's complicated to get into a particular state. Um, so that's cool, that also requires things like Redux and and a good setup for React um, and the best feature, which is just oh, so good. You can actually test do front end browser testing, which is something I just like, completely given up on with things like Selenium and like having the the browser like click like in the browser automatic automated click on things. I just thought that that was never going to work and like. All of the all the times that I had seen it tried, it, it was like really brittle and really hard to debug. Um, both React, because it is a function essentially that turns state into HTML, you can just with whatever testing system you have make tests and put new data into this function and see what you get and compare that string to what it should be. Um, so the, the last point, the last negative point is that React moves really fast. Um, it's three years old. There's been like 14 or 15 major releases, um, which is good because you know bugs get fixed. Um, there are new tools being developed. Lots of people are working on it. Uh, the documentation is pretty good and it stays up to date. Um, lots of people are doing presentations. Um, there's, there is already a React conf. Uh, there's also a React on Europe. Uh, so there are, there are lots of presentations about this if you want to learn about React. Um, and lots of people are doing examples and talks like this. So there's lots of activity in the community. But it also means that things that you are using now and our best practices might not be best practices in the future. As a specific example, um, there's, a, there's a feature called mix-ins, which was for uh, sharing code between components. Um, we use a few mixins in some places at Mover, and that is not the best practice anymore. So we have to, it, it's not deprecated yet, um, but certainly other things have been deprecated. Um, uh, various ways of like accessing the DOM have been uh, deprecated, not that you should end up doing that that often. Um, yeah, and other API changes. So. Good thing and a bad thing. Uh, if you need to stay up to date, if you like feel it in your soul that you have to be on the bleeding edge, then this might be a problem. Um, if you can, if you can get behind a little bit, it's it's less of a problem. Um, so that's it. Uh, questions about React and when to use it, Sean. Um, speaking of like moving really really fast, because uh, Angular one and two are very much having this problem um, right now on the bridge. But the community is doing a really good job of actually maintaining Angular. There's very active releases in Angular 1, even though Angular 2 has already been released. I think React can do the same sort of thing. Like there's a security issue in the latest version of the back forth after the older versions, or? Uh, good question. No, I, don't. Okay. I haven't. I've never seen them 
Like there's there's not like a long term support. There's no there's no LTS release of React. Like they're not even at version one officially. I don't know what version one looks like for them. Um, they're at like version point sixteen. So they're not especially the same version. Yeah. No. Well, I mean, they are, but you know, versions. What do they mean? Um, but yeah, I don't I don't think they've ever like back stuff, but again, I'm not actually paying attention to that. I'm looking at the, the head release. So, I know in the past you didn't have to use JSX with React. Is that still the case, or has that kind of changed? You don't have to. Um, it's kind of impractical because the JSX looks a lot better than, and like it looks like HTML and it's and it's structured like HTML. Whereas the other way of doing it is all the all those. All this HTML gets turned into JavaScript functions, um, and you can write those JavaScript functions if you want, but it's callback help basically. So because because everything needs to be nested because it's like here's the definition of what this is, and then here's the children, and here's the definition of the children, and then, yeah. So it's bad. Um, you want? Yeah, uh, React does like a diff on the data as it gets sort of rendered. I was wondering if, the, if there's any tools for the React that's inside of the box, which I know, but like it has allows the templates to get diffed. So like if I um, modify the template itself as opposed to the data, like is there any diffing sort of magic that can happen there to like, make sure the template comes up nicely? Like live? Um, or do you well, mean like tool? Not be live, but that would be cool too. Uh, I don't I don't know that there's anything. Like your template should look like HTML, um, and I guess there's there's like linters and stuff um, that will help you with that. But I don't know that there's anything I'll that. Give you an example. Like if two different um, pieces of code want to modify the same template, like, is there a way to accommodate? That's like, not really how React works. So like you're you're gonna, I guess I I, I guess I'm gonna skip this part. Um, this declarative, declarative is a word that you will see a lot in the React documentation. Um, what they mean by that is that you're going to state what you want your your app to look like <coughs> given this this state, and then React is going to figure out how to get you into that state. So you're never doing you're never doing anything to like look at the current state. What do I have to do to get into the next state? React's going to figure that out. So the diffing process that React does is it's going to look at what's the HTML that's already there. It's going to generate the, the new HTML based on what the new state is. And then it's going to apply that the diff to the DOM. And so only the only things that are touching the DOM is going to be the, the changes, the small changes that, that are actually it's opinion of what's there, not necessarily what's actually there, right? No, True. Well, yeah. Yeah. yeah kind of. If you go and change the DOM not with React, it won't, it won't know, because it, it is keeping a virtual, it's a much small, it's a stripped down version of, of what's actually in the DOM, because um, there's a whole bunch of like extra stuff in the DOM that makes it slow to do this tipping from the DOM to, to React. You, you do actually do that at times, right? So one of the way, one of the times to do that is when you're editing a field, for example, or a couple ways you can do it. But one of the ways you can do it is you put a text field on the screen, and then what React would like you to do is every time you type a letter, that becomes a change state change that goes back to the back end and then or into into the display logic. Or you do lots of work and then it comes back and repaints the screen again. But you can, in fact, just let HTML handle those updates yep. to the text field. So <coughs> it's certainly not encouraged. And in fact, I never do that. You, know, you might do that when you're sort of lazy to start. But it is possible to. Yeah. So here, now you have two conflicting things, right? You've got a model that HTML has and a model that you have to understand. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you're not concerned with getting that update every every single time, then you, you can leave that. But yeah. But the short, the short answer to your question is that all those conflicts that you have get resolved in the state in your backend. You figure out exactly what your new state of your application is going to be. 
And then you just take this big blob of state, and then you just throw it up on the screen, whatever it is. Okay. So you're never making those decisions at the last minute, and you're never sort of picking up control of it and saying, I'm going to change that, to make it blue now. What you do is you go to your back end and say, this control has some attribute that means it should be blue. And then React says, OK, I'm going to repaint the whole screen, and oh, wait, that's blue. Okay. The whole idea of template versus state is the state it, it describes the parts that change. The template describes the sort of static representation of the data that's changing, but you're not live changing your template. If you have something that you want to live change, then you have to create some sort of state that describes, like if you want a color theme that changes or whatever, you have to create some data in your state model that describes the color theme. Yeah. I think the template word may be kind of narrow and kind of in terms of yeah. it's it it's kind of small and what we're doing here is actually much bigger. Yeah, they they don't actually call them templates; they call them components. But for simple purposes, it's kind of the same as handlebars, but it is it can be much more complicated. Yeah. Uh, other questions about when to? I saw you first. Um, I see. Like some of the, I guess, more popular React libraries, like React Router and um, you have still have sort of like you can snatch these stuff, but then you actually in the JSX they have like the routes and stuff like that. Is that a common thing? Yeah. So the React Router, I use React Router. I don't love React Router, um, but it's it's handling. So there's two there's two ways of doing this. React itself has a way of handling state. So like. You can have a stateful component that all of its state is stored internally. This only works for really simple things. Like, if, as long as if you're not sharing data between components, then it can work. Um, you'll end up having problems probably. Um, but most of the time, you'll want to have like an external data store. Um, React Router um, can can work that way with a, like an external data store and having stuff fed back into it to do its data um, to make have have changes happen um, but like by default it kind of stores things internally does so, that maybe so not well, answer your question uh, yeah well kind of makes another question but uh, so like the gsx then um so it, it's declared that way because react is like quote unquote the only thing at dc there's no other way for the components to share um, so there's there's two ways that components share information. There's there's state that um, can change, and then there's props which gets fed in um, from the parent component, and that is immutable or should be immutable. Um, so in most cases, you want to rely on props a lot more than state, um, and have the 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 state management has, should be outside of of React. Two minutes. Okay. That's your. Uh, I guess. Well, I'm okay. still, I'm still, okay, I guess what I'm thinking is that they have these child and parent components. Like, mm -hmm. So, like the read Redux component is like it's basically parent with like JSX components, and the parent component, the child component, and the parent because it holds a state for like, a, like an application wide state, right? Whereas if you had any of them, you would have like a service that you like you know, injected. And there's no other way. There's no there's no injection dependency injection. Yeah, right? so they have to have Oh no, there is. Like you'll you'll pull pull in state from an external store. Oh okay okay. Yeah. and that's we'll get to that in <laughs> in, the, in the next one. Um, hopefully, I can answer your question quickly. Briefly, kind of compare the tracks and the rehash. Oh, so flux is a methodology, I guess. Um, so it is talking about a one-way data flow. Um, uh, I won't. I could. I could go look it up. There, there's. There's a diagram that just says, okay. So user interaction happens. It creates an action. The action is like a JavaScript object. Um, that action gets sent to data stores, which is what Redux is. The action gets interpreted. Um, 
to change whatever is in the data store, and then that the fact that the data store has changed gets announced back to React through some means, um, and then React will re-render re based on this new state that it gets. So you see like the Redux kind of implementation of the React? No, Redux is the store. Like store. Yeah. Part of we're yeah. actually going to have a whole talk yeah. about React here for a couple of months. So um, next, we have one that's kind of like an intro with actually building a React app. Um, and then we're going to do Redux after that, yeah. React Native after that. And then there's a couple of things we probably talk about. We'll find your more <laughs> React after that. Okay. okay. Thanks, Thanks for All right, so for our last talk tonight, uh, we have Ben Zitlau. He's going to be talking about the magic of pouch and couch and um, just building things that sync up. So uh, <laughs> let you take it from there, Ben. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm going to try my computer. Yeah. Is that, we're getting pretty good sound. Are you? Okay, I'm not going to bother. Okay, cool. Um, first of all, you've all been sitting very patiently while we all stand up and stretch. Take 10 seconds. Feels good. I'll try and get my slides. Okay. First slide. Okay. Yeah, grab some water. Okay. Um, Curious how we're going to do for size. Does that seem okay? It does. Tell me when that's readable. Is that readable? The console? Yeah. There? Yeah. There? Yeah. One, more. One more? Yeah. Okay, try that. Um, so uh, you're going to have to bear with me uh, standing behind the podium because I find it really hard to do a talk without doing live things. So we're going to do a little bit of some live stuff during the talk. <clears throat> um, it's good that a lot of you have interest in offline stuff. There's a lot of people who, who mentioned that they had some interest in, in dealing with offline stuff. Um, we're not going to deal with uh, the, everything about offline stuff. We're going to talk a little bit about dealing with data. Uh, in an offline state during this talk. And uh, where I first kind of started looking at coach, coach and Coach is looking at one of our applications where we want to start dealing with offline data. I started looking around and doing some research into like, how should you do this? And the comment of, oh, just use Post to be kept on coming up. Um, it's not the easiest thing to do if you're already using it in another database, but if you're starting a new project, um, there's some very interesting things about it. Um, but it is not, of course, the magical silver bullet that's good at everything. Um, it's basically about everything but sync, and I'll talk about that as we go through the talk. Uh, so first of all, my name is Ben Zillow. Um, these are a few of my properties. If you just search for Ben Zillow, as far as I can tell, I'm the only Ben Zillow in the world. So if you find something, it's probably me, unless it's bad, in which case it's not me. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is... Uh, Two, two different databases, so CoachDB, PouchDB, they're, as you can tell from the names, very closely related, but they are two different things. I'm going to talk about what's the wow moment, so like what's the, you know, what's the, what's the selling pitch of it? Like when, when you go, oh, this is neat, this is something that I'd want to use. Um, a little bit more details about what they are and what they bring. And, uh, you know, the here be dragons on the map, so, so where are the dragons? Um, but first, uh, shameless plug. So if you uh, have known me recently, you might have been expecting the guy on the left, and instead you've gone the guy on the right. Um, so a, a job where we're participating in Movember, um, for anyone who's not familiar with Movember, it's uh, a fundraiser that runs through uh, November where people grow really ugly mustaches um, to raise awareness around men's health, because why not? 
Um, so if you're interested, uh, we do have a job or team up. I'm on here. Um, I'm at the very start of growing my ugly mustache. Hopefully later in this month, I'll be further along. Um, would really appreciate if anyone you know throw wants to throw anything at that five bucks, ten bucks, anything like that, be appreciated. Um, aside from that, get out there, eat healthy, be active, etc. Okay, um, so let's start getting into it. So, so we're gonna first talk about what's the wow moment. Um, so I'm going to do a magic trick. So this is a, a, I watched Prestige lately and there's this great line. It goes, the magician shows you something ordinary, but of course it probably isn't. Uh, then he then takes that something ordinary and he makes it do something extraordinary. So, so that's what I'm going to do next here. Um, so the something ordinary that I'm working with is something called to do MVC. I think it's been shown here before, um, but basically to do MVC is just this project where they've written the same app Oh, that's interesting. I don't know what's going on there. Uh, okay. Anyways, we're not going to go there because. Yeah, yeah. Anyways, I don't know why that's going on. Anyways, to do MVC is just a project where they've written the same basic to do app in React, in Ember, and Angular. So if you want to like, play around with each of those, you can go there and get the code for it. Um, I took the Ember version of the to do MVC app. And I didn't change any of the business logic. All I changed was what I was using for storing its data. So kind of like Greg was talking around in terms of how do we store the state in the app, I didn't change anything else. Um, so this is my version of it. Uh, this looks the same, you know, any of these that you take. So we're just going to make like a basic shopping list. I need milk, I need butter, maybe some apples, uh, bread. You know, nothing too exciting here. You can like mark these you know, completed, you know, pretty cool feature. You can delete things. Um, so again, all they've done with to do MVC is the same thing that will behave the same across all those different uh, MVCs. Um, so the first thing that I'm going to go, the first trick here is that this is going to persist. So some people are talking about using local storage. Um, you know, there is this challenge often where our state, when we're working with JavaScript in the browser, disappears when someone does this and they come in to hit reload and everything goes away. So the first demo is that everything didn't go away. So I was actually able to persist my data. So this is using um, Ember data and Ember Pouch, which I'll talk about a little bit. But basically I'm using PouchDB, just like you'd be using um, your local storage so that that data is stored so I can you know, reload, the user can leave and come back and my data is still there. So that's trick number one. Uh, you might have seen that one before. Okay, trick number two is <laughs> offline. So I can go here, and there's this very handy thing in Chrome where I can pretend to be offline. And you know I can still add um, more stuff. What else do I need? Maybe I need um, more margarine along with my butter for some reason. Um, and I can still continue to use my app when I'm offline. Um, maybe that's not, uh, not too exciting yet at this point. Uh, trick number three, real time link between sessions. So. If I go to that same URL over here in incognito, so for anyone who's not familiar with that, when you go into incognito mode, it can't access um, that local data that you have. So if you're using local storage or using IndexedDB or any of those things, <laughs> uh, you won't get your data. Um, but magically, I did. So how did that happen, I wonder? Uh, well, I'm not going to tell you yet. I'll tell you later. Um, so uh, first thing is that that data came across, and the other neat thing is that it's coming across in real time. So as I do things over here, um, God, I'm having such a hard time thinking craft dinner. Why not? Um, as I do things, it's coming across the other one in real time, and of course I can go the other way. It's going to do the same thing. Okay, so that's my next little trick. Okay, what's next? Offline addition of new elements. So now I can go offline here. So the one on the left is still online. This one has become disconnected. Um, you know, maybe uh, I don't have a data plan. I'm walking to the store. I add something to my grocery list. Uh, um, coffee, milk. As you can see, because I'm offline, it's not syncing over to my other session here on the left. Um, but as soon as I come back online, there we go. So that data came across to the other one. I didn't have to do anything. Again, I didn't do any business logic to do this. All I did was just change what the MVC was using for the backend. So that's my next trick. Um, offline editing of existing elements. So again, I added things, but I have to go in here 
and say I actually decided I wanted tea instead of coffee. So again, I am offline right now. We can see that that didn't update on the left side, but when I connect, it will update onto the left there. So there we go. So it's magically that transit over to the left side. Now this is where it gets really interesting. Offline conflicts. So what happens when I go offline here and I decide, you know, instead of bread, I actually want pitas um, while my, my spouse or something is over here and they actually decide that instead of bread, they want bagels. <coughs> so what's going to happen when I go back offline, back online? That same one has been edited on both sides where they can't talk to each other. And when I go back online, magically it resolves that conflict for me. So it decided that between those two, it was going to take one of them and just everything synced. There was no errors. Everything is happy. So I don't know if you've ever tried to do this. <laughs> this is really hard to do, and I had to do no work to do it. I just got it for free just by changing what I was using to store my data. So that's pretty cool. At least I think that's pretty cool. So that is my magic trick. Um, that is my something ordinary doing something extraordinary. Um, so with that, now we're going to look a little bit more about what actually happened there. How did I make that, that happen? Um, so a bit more about Poach and Coach and what they're actually bringing to the table. Um, so behind the curtain, so the technical stack here, again, was Ember, um, Ember Data, PostDB, and CoachDB. Um, Ember technology, so Ember, again, is just a JavaScript MVC. It's, it's one of the kind of main forerunners up there with Angular and React, if you want to call React an MVC, even though, of course, it's mostly the V part, but if you pull the other pieces in. Um, Ember Data is an Ember Core project, which is just kind of like the flux side. It's the store part of the Ember project, so it handles that persistence of your data for you. Um, they weren't really important to what I just did, so I'm not going to talk about them today. Uh, that could be a different talk later, uh, more about Ember and Ember Data. Um, we could have used any other uh, JavaScript MVC framework and, and done the same trick. Um, so what is more important is the Poach and Coach side. So uh, PoachDB's, their official descript description is PoachDB is an open source JavaScript data database inspired by Apache CoachDB that's designed to run well within the browser. So basically, it's an open source JavaScript based uh, database that runs inside the browser. Um, depending on which environment it's running in, it will gracefully fall back. So it will use indexed DB, which is just a standard if that's available in the, in the browser it's in. I will fall back to WebSQL, um, which I believe is an earlier standard. If it can't use indexed DB, uh, it'll use level DB if it's on Node. Um, and it's pretty broadly supported. So PostDB will run on uh, all the usual suspects, Firefox, Chrome, Safari, Internet Explorer, um, Opera. Uh, I'm not actually really sure exactly what they mean by Android and iOS. Presumably the, the default browsers in, in Android and iOS um, and, uh, and Windows Phone. Um, so now we're, we're going to do some live stuff. Actually, don't need that quite yet. Um, to install it, they have it basically available on a CDN. So if you want to like start playing around with PoachDB, um, all you need to do is take this top line, add it into your page, or I've got this, this that you can just copy and paste into console, and it will load it for you. I already have it loaded. Um, this is kind of the most basic thing that you can do, which is uh, writing some, some data. I actually can't, unfortunately, zoom that really using reveal. Um, but uh, you just initialize a database. You can give it any database name. And then we're going to put some data in there. So we're going to put something we're going to call exchange.js. It's on November 4th, which is funny because I got the date wrong. Um, and the speakers are Ben Zitlau. So we can go into our console, take that exact text, paste into here. Um, and if you copy all the text, um, you won't get a syntax error. Um, so it, it, it ran. I'm not going to talk too much about what, what happened yet. Um, the next thing that we're going to do is, oh, 
I'm just surprised. Okay, something you might have noticed if you used to work with databases, I just put something in database. I didn't do anything with a schema. Um, PostDB is non-relational, so there's no joins or anything like that. If you're used to working with an SQL-based database, you won't have that. Um, I stole this uh, table from the PostDB website. There's no concept of a table at all. Um, a row is called a document. A column is called a field. Um, and they call the same index as a view, which I kind of disagree with a bit. But basically, they, they try and map SQL concepts to Pouch. Um, but if you're more used to working with any other NoSQL, so a Mongo or something like that, it's, it's closer to that. Um, what's more fun, though, now that I've gotten that boilerplate of the way, is we're going to go and we're going to fetch back that same result that we just uh, put in. And we can see that I said get exchange.js, which is what we called the ID when I added it. And we can see that it has the data that I put on it. So it says the date is November 4th. I can go look at speakers. The speakers is an array with Ben Zillow in it. So that's the most basic thing you can do with the database, right? I wrote something into it. I read that same thing back. Um, this actually really ties into Casey's talk. So one of the neat things about the PostDB library is it's kind of a little thing, but it supports both callbacks and promises. So when you do any operation, if you pass in a second argument, you can give it a callback. It will use that callback, um, but it also returns a promise. Um, so these two syntaxes are um, effectively equivalent a little bit because like here the errors passed here where if, again like in the promise just like Casey was talking I should actually have a catch block otherwise any errors are just gonna disappear um, but also like Casey was saying this can become really important in PostDB because you end up doing a lot of with promises chaining or with callbacks nesting so using the promise syntax things tend to fall out a lot better um, and especially you can see this when you start going to edit data. So we wrote something, we read it back, what if we want to edit it? So the naive thing would be like, oh, I want to just like actually fix the speakers because I realized I wasn't the only one talking. I'm going to add in um, Casey and Greg's name. If we uh, look in our dictionary for some reason, no. If we take that code and try and run that, we're going to get this error going conflict document update conflict so unfortunately it's not that easy um, every time you do an, an edit in PouchDB you need to give it back the full document so you can't just edit certain fields and you also have to give it something called a, re a rev or a revision um, so you can do that manually usually it's easier to just do this type of chain here where uh, I guess I can use this which button is the laser oh it's the other one sorry. The other one, this one, yeah, laser, laser. All right. Um, so the first thing I'm doing here is I'm fetching that document, then I'm editing it. So I'm adding the additional speakers, um, and then I'm doing this return promise where I put it. So I, I write that back now. So that's going to have the full document. It's going to have the revision number on it because it was on it when I fetched it, um, and then it's going to just change that attribute, write that back, and then you have to do this. So if you want to continue working with it, you then have to fetch it again, which seems weird, and we'll get to that later. And then I output what I got out of that. So if we take that code and we run that, hopefully this will do what we want it to do. So we got an object out here. Um, it looks just like it did before with the, the date still being November 4th. We can now see that it has all the speakers in it, great. Um, one thing that you might notice if you're particularly observant is before, I don't think this is it, is, oh, yeah, before, notice how our revision started with one, and now our revision starts with two. Maybe there's something to that, and we'll, we'll get to that in a bit. Um, but basically, I got back this edited document. Oh, God, time flies. We can go from time to question. Okay, so why? Why are we needing to give it the revision and the full document back? Well, to stop us from getting conflicts. Now, conflict seems a little bit weird when we're only working with our own data. Um, like, how are we going to end up like conflicting with our own rights to our database? I did a bit of a contrived example here where we're going to create a counter with account one. I'm then going to uh, get that back. So just like I did before, I'm going to fetch that. I'm going to just assign it to this variable, which I've conveniently placed in the global scope. I'm going to edit it, 
and then I'm going to update it, and then I'm going to try incrementing it to 3, and then writing it again. So the initial value was 1. I fetch it, change it to 2, write it to the database, change it to 3, write it to the database, um, which, again, from a naive standpoint, seems like that should work. But what's going to happen here is that the first one went fine, the second one went fine, but because I didn't refetch that document, what happened when I went to write it the third time is that the revision was still one. So the set, when I went to change it, I was saying the revision that I had was one, and I'm trying to change revision one. But if I need fetch it again, the revision would have gone to two. So I could say the revision I have is two, and I'm trying to change revision two. But unless I refetch it, it still believes I'm trying to change revision one. So I change revision one once, and now I'm going back and saying I'm trying to change revision one again. And it doesn't like that. It doesn't like me saying like, oh, I'm going to change the, the past and this thing that I've already changed, I'm, I'm going to try and change again. And again, this all seems really contrived and unnecessarily complicated when you're just dealing with PostDB on its own. And this kind of goes back to the earlier comment that's bad at everything. Like if you're just trying to use it for this, this is probably a lot more hassle than it's worth your time. There's probably other libraries which are going to make more sense. But now comes the couch part of Pouch Couch. Um, so Couch and Pouch um, are siblings. Uh, Couch is the basically the older sibling of Pouch. Um, they implement the same API, so basically anything you can do against Couch, you can do against Pouch, and it's almost mechanical refactor. So this is just an example where I'm using an all docs, which is just giving me everything, and there's this command called include docs. Couch, the interface is HTTP. So similarly here, this Couch, I'd be hitting a URL, and I go to do MVC, all docs, include docs equals true. Um, which just maps to all docs and few docs equals true, and in theory, we should just be able to do that. These are all my to-do documents that I've gotten back from my couch database. And I would get the same results if I took this code and I ran it against uh, pouch. So they're basically the same type of database. Just one's giving me this JavaScript interface and it's running in JavaScript. Another is running wherever and it's giving me an HTTP interface, the same API. Um, one of the neat things about Pouch is you can run Pouch off of a couch. So before, when I just gave Pouch a string that was just to do MVC, that just created its own database. It handles that all for you. It already like um, looks to see if there's an existing database, creates it for free, all that kind of stuff. Um, but if I pass it a URL, I can actually connect to a couch database. So I have a couch database running in the background, and what this is going to do is instead of creating one locally in my browser, this is actually going to connect to my couch database and uh, start running operations against that. So again, I can run that same command, but here instead of getting my local results from this like index db backed Couch, uh, pouch database is connecting to my remote database, um, but the interface looks exactly the same. Nothing has changed in terms of how I use it. All I had to change was this argument that I gave it. Um, now this is where things start to get really interesting is in replication. So just like I was talking, I can create a local database just by giving a string. I connect to a remote database um, by giving it this URL to a remote database. Um, and then I can write something to my local DB. So that's what I'm doing here. Local DB put. So this is like what I was doing earlier when I was adding things. And then when I when that finishes, I'm going to tell it that I want to replicate my local database to that remote database. So it's going to copy everything that I have in my browser to Couch. So again, I can take this right now. If we went and tried to go to this URL, there's nothing there. If I run this code which is, again, going to write it to my local database and then replicate it over. I love these errors. The above 404 is totally normal. PostDB is just detecting if the remote exists. Uh, it's very informative, actually. Um, and if we go there, we can now see that my document has appeared on this remote server um, just running that command. So that's pretty cool. Um, and what's really cool about this is you can do any freaking thing you want to do with this replication. So you can make any, like one of these pouch or couch DBs, 
replicate to anywhere, any of them. You can connect them in any way that you want. So it's just a diagram showing that I can have my local database talking to this one and talking to this one, this one talks to this one. You can create a chain. So you can do all kinds of creative things thinking about how you want your data to flow around between these different databases and do that really easily. I'm out of time, so I'm going to tie this up quick. Um, basically, where I want to go is, uh, in this case, what I'm going to do really here, just you're going to have to believe me on this. I'm not going to talk through, the, through what this is doing. But I'm writing that a document to my local database. I'm writing that directly to my remote database with something different. And then I'm going to tell them to sync. So there's one locally and there's one remote, just like when I was doing that offline example. And they conflict with each other. Um, and we can see document update conflict. Um, but if I go and look at what happened in the back end, conflict doc. Um, oh, I actually somehow managed to not create a conflict. But if we want to go to a couple minutes of question, how do you do that? Yeah. Is that yes. Really one of these will. Oh. Okay. Well, this I'll do hand waving because for some reason that command didn't work. But what it actually does is it will keep both. It's just like Git. It actually keeps both versions. So if I create a conflict. Even though when I did that first demo where I did offline and they like magically chose one, it chooses one by default, but it keeps a full history of that object and any conflicts that have happened. So you as a developer can go in there, look for those conflicts, create an interface for a user where if they don't like the default that it chose, they can resolve. But that can happen outside of your main user flow. So users can be using the application. They don't get blocked. Everything works. But if they want to go and like resolve those conflicts manually themselves later, you can build an interface and allow them to do that. Um, and then just really quick, um, this is a quote by CoachDB contributor. The way, the, the way I like to think about CoachDB is this. It's bad at everything except syncing. And it turns out that that's the most important feature you could ever ask for from any types of software. Um, so basically, that idea that has all these problems um, and these are real problems, but if you want offline syncing uh, or just syncing in general, this will give it to you for basically no work as a developer. You just have to accept all of the trade-offs. <laughs>
Great. Awesome. Well, thanks, Ben. Cool. All right. So we're trying to keep this moving uh, along tonight so everyone can go and have drinks after. Uh, just a couple of quick things before we go. Uh, like always, I really want to say thank you to the people that support the meetup. So again, uh, that's Jobber. They've done uh, a lot to take care of food for this year. Um, they gave us a very big donation, which we really appreciated. And uh, it's made things a lot easier. Let me focus a bit more on the talks and stuff like that. So big thanks to Jobber. You guys are awesome. Um, and also, uh, thank you to Startup Edmonton. They've uh, supported us for a long time and give us a nice venue here to provide the events and things like that. So if you haven't checked them out, uh, definitely come. There's lots of co-working spaces and things like that, and they have a lot of fun events. Um, our meetup site is actually the Startup Edmonton meetup site, so that's a great place to kind of take a look if you want to see what else they're doing. Uh, reminder, the next meetup, Thursday, December 1st. And I also will say I did double check the date, and it is the hack up on the 16th. Uh, that's the Wednesday. So, Wednesday, November 16th is the hack up. And with that, I will wrap up, move, and go have some beers. I would like to grab the people that want to talk about the hack up. If you guys want to go down uh, and have beers, we can do that. Otherwise, we can talk quickly here before. Um, I'll just stick around. Okay, thanks, everyone. See you next time. You can actually go look at the index DB. I Yeah, no, um, we have, they were supposed to meet in the last month. So these are all the revisions. So, like, to do two. So, this is the to do with the ID2. And we can see that each one of these revisions has the full object on it, but it will be